Hi, I'm Ken Fisher. Welcome to the 17th season of Citywide. All year we're talking about the big issues impacting the lives of New Yorkers. My guest on this edition of Citywide is Kelly Williams, General Counsel at the Brennan Center for Justice at New York University School of Law. That is a mouthful. Thank you for joining us. What is the Brennan Center for Justice? Um, well, thank you for having me today. Um, the Brennan Center is a public interest law firm and think tank. Um, we focus on uh, issues of democracy and justice. And housed within the law school? Um, we're affiliated with NYU Law School. Um, the, uh, a third of our board members are uh, on the faculty at the law school. Um, we share uh, um, some facilities and the library with the law school, but we're a, a long and close affiliation with the law school, and we're very proud of it. So, do you, when you say you're a public interest law firm, do you, mm -hmm. do you, are you, do you represent people in court? Are you an advocacy organization? What are some of the activities you? Well, you know, the the typical Brennan Center project begins with a research project. We, um, you know, look, we focus on an issue um, that we feel is, um, a, you know, a, a, a basic tenet of our democracy, such as um, the right to vote. We um, research the issue. We figure out what you know. How can we get more people to vote? What are the barriers to voting? Um, once we have that, we um, we uh, have a large legal staff. We also engage in litigation on this issue. Um, in the last uh, election, 2012, we um, litigated in um, several states protecting the right to vote. Um, uh, voter suppression laws across the country were um, a focus of our litigation efforts. Um, once we you know have the research in hand, um, we may or may not litigate on an issue. We also, um, if we decide that there's a possibility for a, a good and solid change in public policy, we're um, you know prepared to use our research and the case law that we've developed to you know advocate for a change in the law. If my memory is correctly, it was a Brennan Center research study that um, famously. Uh, found that the New York State Legislature was the most dysfunctional in the in the country. Yes, it, it, is that still the case? The I think that the the word dysfunctional can still apply to many aspects of the New York State Legislature. You know, where we're, we've made a lot of progress on um, uh, the rules, the way that legislation passes through the legislature over the years. As a result of that study, when people uh, actually, when I'm out in the community and I mention that I work at the Brennan Center. Um, I would say most New Yorkers are most familiar with the Brennan Center's study on the New York State Legislature. You know, at the time, it's now been almost a decade since we um, issued that original study. It's been updated um, two or three times, I think. Um, the uh, um, that we, you know, through careful analysis, we determined that the legislature was the most expensive legislature in, legislature in the world in terms of, you know, what it costs um, to actually run the legislature per. Capita in the state, um, the, uh, um, the you know, a lack of deliberation, um, you know, a, a sort of a logjam of uh, uh, bills that were being introduced every session without like a clear path to have them, you know, truly examined. And then probably the most, um, you know, nagging thing of all was just that the, um, uh, the just how small the bottleneck came when it came time to decide these laws and which ones were actually going to go up for a vote. It was really just a few people. So most of the New Yorkers, that was well covered in the local press, all the papers. Uh, and it the, still comes up every time there's up. a controversy. It, it still comes up. I still, people still remember that more than our work on voting, which actually was, you know, affected, um, you know, the rights of millions of people to vote in 2012 and um, in the midterm elections in 2010 and was, you know, widely covered in the national press as well. I think, though, for 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 many people, um, it's hard to understand how the mechanics of government affect the outcome of the legislative process. 
particularly because in New York, you know, going back for, for decades with very few exceptions, uh, you've got one house of the legislature controlled by the Democratic Party and the other house controlled by the Republican Party. And if they don't see eye to eye on something, there's no reason for either one of them to, to compromise. Is, the, is that the core of the dysfunction or is it something about the, the nature of the bodies themselves? You know, a lot of it, that, there's, partisan politics is always a large part of government dysfunction. And um, I don't think that New York is any more prone to that than a lot of places. Um, a lot of what we feel could be made better in Albany has to do with like little technical uh, changes to um, the rules. And uh, that is especially hard for the average person on the street to understand. It, it makes our job a little more difficult at uh, the Brennan Center when you're trying to explain. You know, you do need to be a lawyer. You almost need a law degree to understand why it is that your local assemblyman can't just get that good bill passed and, you know, at least bring it to a vote. At least let us know who's on the record and, you know, who's for, who's against. Why, why is that? It's because of uh, a you know, plethora of rules that, you know, uh, keep good legislation, you know, in committee, keep it from advancing to the floor. Um, it, it, it's a tough job explaining that to people. We, we, we've, we've just come off a, a series of corruption indictments. Yeah. Um, shockingly, um, at least two members of the legislature that we know about, sitting members of the legislature, um, secretly recording conversations with their colleagues in order to get out from uh, more harsh punishment for mm -hmm. their own uh, crimes, uh, others under investigation. And um, is, the, is the legislature more corrupt than it used to be or just the prosecutors have, have gotten more effective or lucky? The, uh, I, you know, I, it, it, I, 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 have, I have no idea. I mean, it, it's, it was a very strange legislative session. The, the, the corruption scandals definitely changed the game in Albany this spring. Um, you know, an observer would have thought that uh, different kinds of reform legislation, um, you know, the kind of reform that, you know, would address the exact specific things that happened in each of those cases and then more systemic reform that would be, you know, that's been on the table for years that would help change the culture in Albany. You would think those things would just sail through. Uh, public opinion polls across the state for the last two years show that voters across party lines, uh, upstate and downstate, really want reform. Um, every statewide elected official is on record as supporting, you know, several reform packages, all of them endorsed by every good government group in the state. And you know, now we're two weeks from the end of the session, and it's it's a little frustrating. Because it goes into the great blender, and then yeah, all the flavor gets squeezed out. But yeah, it. that's um, but it's only two that's years. That's the technical explanation. It's only two years ago that the legislature did an ethics reform package. Mm -hmm. The governor yeah. said a new day yes. had had come. Um, is there any evidence that that set of reforms, the new legislative commissions and the joint commission mm -hmm. that was set up to, to police mm -hmm. ethics, are they having any impact? Well, the new ethics commission, the, when Governor Cuomo took office, one of his first acts was to um, begin work on a comprehensive ethics reform package. And um, uh, um, it had been decades since there had been a real comprehensive look at ethics oversight in the state. Um, by ethics oversight, I mean the way that people are, the way that people who are, hold public office are like asked to report what their outside income is, um, what kind of um, outside employment they can take, what their, um, you know, what they have to disclose to the public, um, how those complaints about public officials are handled. That, that, that's what I mean by ethics reform. That package that um, Governor Cuomo introduced um, was the Public Integrity Reform Act of 2011. It changed the ethics oversight structure. Um, it gave uh, into the Joint Commission on Public Ethics. Jake Hope now has some power to investigate the legislature. We just saw an important first uh, test of that with the Vito Lopez investigation. This uh, is a member of the assembly, member of the assembly accused yes. of sexual harassment. Mm -hmm. yeah. The assembly settles the case. Mm -hmm. It leaks that the yeah. case has been settled. How did that become an ethics investigation? 
Um, it, well, uh, there was an, uh, there was a complaint against um, the uh, um, people in the assembly about how that had been handled and whether or not it had been handled the right way by the legislature using public money to, you know, settle these lawsuits. Um, Jacob, uh, uh, my Joint Commission on Public Ethics, this new ethics oversight entity, they um, voted to um, undertake and begin an investigation. They uh, conducted an investigation, wrote a report. The next step in that process was to hand the um, report over to the legislature. And so they didn't have the ability to, to do anything about it, they could just write a report? Well, they, they, were, they were allowed to investigate, they were allowed to um, uh, write a report, they were allowed, you know, they sent the report to the legislature, and then the way the new ethics law is written, after a certain period of time, if the legislature doesn't make, doesn't take action, the report becomes public, and that's what happened in this case. So that worked um, as planned, that, and um, you know it's a, it, it, it's potentially a powerful tool. It's uh, basically the way that um, the Office of Congressional Ethics is set up at um, the federal level. This system was modeled on that. First time you had um, an an ethics oversight entity in our state that had the power to investigate the legislature. This was a first in New York State. And um, and it, it worked. They conducted an investigation. It was thorough. It um, you know they uh, wrote a report. The report was given to the legislature, and then it was made public. It, this is a first. Um, and um, you know it's so it, it's remarkable that that is a breakthrough that there's I, <laughs> any scrutiny at all. Yeah, it's 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 never going to be. Um, it, it, this is always going to be hard. Ethics oversight is always hard. It's been hard at the federal level. Um, it's not going to be easy in New York State, but um, you know, it looks like we have some very good people at JCOP and on the commission, and that they're really committed to, you know, working through these issues and bringing some change. I also, the other thing I think that people don't appreciate about JCOP is I think that they're working very hard to really clarify what the rules are for people and out, you know, reaching out to people, helping educate people um, on what the rules are, uh, being there to, for advice when people, you know, are concerned that they, you know, if they have a question about whether or not they can attend an event or, um, uh, um, you know, how to fill out their reporting forms. So, I, you know. You would think that members of the legislature and their staffs would know whether they can attend an event or not, but I know okay. campaign finance reform is, yeah. is something that's important to the Brennan Center. We're going to talk about that yeah. when Citywide continues right after this. Welcome back to Citywide. We're speaking with Kelly Williams, General Counsel at the Brennan Center for Justice. All right, so we've got a slightly less dysfunctional state legislature, mm -hmm. a mm -hmm. slightly more empowered Eth ethics commission, mm -hmm. um, Half a dozen political figures this year alone taken out of their homes and offices and in, uh, in handcuffs. Mm -hmm. What what do we do about it? What's the solution? What what's the what's the most important thing that the legislature can do to address these ethics issues? Yeah, that's a, it's such a good question, and um, I know it's on a lot of people's mind. And right now, I just today the governor announced um, his own bill for comprehensive campaign finance reform for New York State, including uh, um, a um, public funding option. And um, so the most powerful, the, the answer in a nutshell is the most powerful reform out there to really change the culture in a place like Albany is a comprehensive campaign finance reform but, but why and is public that? funding option. The, none of the uh, elected officials or party leaders who were indicted um, this year were indicted because of campaign contributions. It was either, in most cases, thievery or, or, or bribery. What, what does campaign finance reform have to do with that? You know, there are two kinds of, when, 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 a, when a place is faced with uh, a, a crisis of corruption like this, there are two approaches. One would be what I would call more like a whack-a-mole approach. Yes, you can change rules that, um, that the, the person who's accused of corruption um, uh, uh, exploited in order to, for their own personal benefit. Um, the Malcolm Smith case, uh, where he's accused of, um, uh, you know, uh, an in a inappropriate interaction with a party leader to get onto the Republican ticket. The, the, I would say that the, you know, the, 
the short term, the, the immediate almost whack-a-mole response to that is, well, let's change the rule so that um, you, you no can't longer have, yeah, have cross endorsements. Right. You know you no longer need the endorsement of the party leader in order to um, get on the ballot. Um, that that would be that's that's like a an immediate fix. It addresses that one situation, but I think that there's a larger issue, and everyone and people again across the state agree that the, the culture of money in Albany definitely needs to be changed. And the way to do that is comprehensive campaign finance reform. We have a bill that passed in the assembly. Um, a bill that's been introduced in the Senate and um, the governor's own proposal. And uh, these, the, there are some small differences between them, but the, the, but together, they, the, the, the four corners of all three of those proposals are close enough that we are very close to, you know, a real reform in so the state. So, Dean right Skelos, now. the head of the Republican mm -hmm. Party, says his caucus is not going to support it. It's a waste of taxpayers' uh, money. But let me ask you this, because yeah. by the by the time some of our viewers yeah. see this, we'll know whether the legislature right, yeah. is going to do this or not. The the city council, uh, mayor, there's public finance in, in New York City. So mm -hmm. does that mean that the city council is less corrupt than the state legislature is? The, you know what, there are always going to be incidents of corruption. You're always, you know, it, it's human nature. There's always going to be, you know, the odd situation here and there. I think that the difference is really night and day between the city council and the state legislature. Tell me why. Just, well, you know, public funding of elections in New York State, this has been ongoing. For two decades, we've had a public funding system in New York State where small do donations from uh, individuals are matched with public money. Um, in fact, if you look at um, the amount of money that go, that um, it, it's, it's a great political science experiment that's being run right now in real time. If you look at the last election in New York City, 93% um, of all of the contributions that candidates to city council races um, collected in the last election are attributable to individuals, real people. Um, they, they were either contributions from um, a real person that was matched by city money, but basically 93% of all the money they candidate to a city council race um, used in his campaign or her campaign came from the, sor the, the source was private individuals. When you look at um, legislative races to the, where there's no public funding option, 70% um, uh, of money that state legislatures, le legislators um, raise comes from sp is special interest money. It's from corporations, it's from unions, it's from um, political act action committees or, or from parties. Only a third, uh, you know, less than a third, comes from private individuals. The, um, you know, these special interest donors, they all have an agenda. It's easy to, it's easier to raise this money than it is from, you know, collecting small donations from, um, from private people. It, it, you know, this kind of fundraising, um, you know, most people come to Albany. They want to do good, but um, faced with the you know need to raise money, the, the 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 ease with which you can raise it from special interests versus private individuals, you know it the 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 real thinking is that this it, it tends to bend a legislator's policy making towards um, their their special interest donors. Touch on another aspect mm -hmm. of enforcement and sort yeah. of the mechanics of all mm -hmm. of this. Um, I'm a pretty cynical guy. I've been around for a while. But mm -hmm. even I was shocked to find out that the State Board of Elections only had one investigator for alleged mm -hmm. campaign finance violations. Yeah. Part of the yeah. system was file the reports, yeah. file them electronically. Everybody can see yeah. them. But if there's no follow-up, it, it kind yeah. of makes the disclosure aspect somewhat illusory. And on the flip side, um, at the city level, we have the City Board of Elections telling us that they may be incapable of running a runoff election, of no mm -hmm. candidate in a party primary gets 40% of the vote, there's a do-over between the top mm -hmm. two a couple of weeks later. The State Board of Elections is saying that, that despite the, having spent millions of dollars on voting machines, they're not going to be able to um, uh, guarantee that they can successfully hold an election. What's wrong with the Board of Elections? It, it, mm. it, it's, and, and, and why has um, the legislature the council, the elected officials at all levels, allow the situation to get to be the way it is. Yeah, I um, the, the state board of elections is definitely a, a 
ripe for overhaul. Um, they definitely need uh, a lot more resources. Um, the governor did um, include in his package of reforms that he released in response to the corruption scandals um, uh, a proposal to add a, a, a special enforcement mechanism um, inside the State Board of Elections and to give them powers to um, investigate and enforce. Uh, hopefully that measure will definitely pass. What about giving the Attorney General that power? The, um, well, right now the, um, you, the State Board of Elections, I think they refer cases to the District Attorney. The, um, and the new counsel would be empowered as a District Attorney, so he'd have those powers. Although they're, the proposal is a little bit more complicated than that, it still has a little element of politics in it. And, but, and unclear. What yeah, about the fact that it, the, the Board of Elections commissioners at both the local level mm -hmm. and at the state level, and in fact, the staff members of the boards of elections are designated by the political parties. It's the last bastion of the political parties that they get to pick the staff of the people that runs the election systems. Is that, is that healthy for democracy? I mean, in an, in, in an ideal world, you'd have a professional, even-handed staff um, conducting the elections, you know, people who um, were far removed from partisan politics. Um, it's complicated. I mean, the State Board of Elections, they have more than 4,000 um, filers. It's an enormous job. Um, uh, they, um, you know, th all the political action committees, all the candidates, not just uh, at the state level, but for all the... And then they have to yeah. organize these mass events mm -hmm. two, three times a year, yeah. thousands of locations, thousands mm -hmm. of, of people yeah. with, with limited resources. But what's more important for our democracy than the way we run our elections? You know, long lines, um, uh, you know, uh, the, conven you know, the convenience of polling places, are they safe? Um, the people did a great job, I have to say, after Sandy, you know, making sure that people in those areas could vote. But um, the, uh, um, there's a lot that could be done. It, it, um, as an advocate for a good government, I definitely am always in favor of allocating more resources to the State Board of Elections, to thinking about ways to professionalize the staff, um, thinking about ways to make it easier to vote. You know, we talked earlier about corruption. The most, one of the most powerful ways to um, uh, reduce um, the influence of special interests in Albany and um, reduce corruption is to get more people participating in the system, make it easier to vote, make it harder for somebody to influence the outcome of an but, election. But the flip side of that is um, that I think that voter cynicism, beyond disillusionment, but mm -hmm. voter cynicism has reached a point where they bring a politician out in handcuffs, the public isn't surprised or shocked anymore. They kind of assume that everybody mm -hmm. is corrupt in the same way that nobody seemed to be particularly surprised that the government collecting phone records or checking out uh, what companies were doing on the internet, they just assumed that government was going to be um, invading their privacy. and not giving them a, a, a fair shake. How do we overcome that sense of um, cynicism that's so deep that you don't get a huge public outcry over it? There aren't thousands of people demonstrating at the state capitol uh, demanding campaign finance reform. It's not to say that there aren't thoughtful people who mm -hmm. made tremendous progress in that area, but there doesn't seem to be any mass movement in this area. And it, you know, is it, is it just that the cynicism is so deep? There is a lot of cynicism, and some of it uh, definitely is, you know, well-founded. Um, the, but, you know, right now, um, Governor Cuomo, um, legislative leaders, um, our elected state officials, they have a real moment in time. They really could come through, put through reforms. These things poll well. When you um, reach out to voters across the state and um, look at public opinion polls, we've done, at the Brennan Center, we've done um, focus group work, um, upstate, downstate, across party lines, among people who are voters and sort of have a record of civic participation. They all want reform. It isn't necessarily their first and highest priority. Um, if they, you know, ask them, what do you want Albany to do this year? They probably say, lower my taxes, improve the schools. But this always this this is pretty much a unanimous issue. People want this, and so if there's so, one if there's one thing that an, an individual viewer mm -hmm, of this show yeah. could do to make a difference, what would that one thing be? I would say sign a petition calling on your legislators to um, uh, enact fair elections and um, uh, and uh, really move campaign finance reform and um, uh, support. Um, 
uh, whatever reform efforts, uh, you know, the good government groups are supporting. I know in a few weeks by the time this airs, they'll, some of them will have passed, some of them won't have. But there's um, another legislative session next there's year. There's always another one next year, so, yeah. My thanks to Kelly Williams, General Counsel at the Brennan Center for Justice at New York University School of Law. Thanks. I'm Ken Fisher. Thanks for joining us in this edition of Citywide. Send your comments and suggestions to Citywide at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. Or contact us at cuny.tv.